Hello, I'm Richmond Felix with your final edition of Nation Beat for this week. Here are the headlines. A holistic strategy tackling crime and violence to be designed by a national crime council. St. Lucia benefits from a groundbreaking initiative for children with disabilities. The Cicero Secondary School gets a theater arts room. And the Solid Waste Management Authority sounds the alarm on illegal disposal practices. A holistic strategy tackling crime and violence on the island is to be developed under the jurisdiction of a National Crime Council. The Council forms part of recommendations coming out of the inaugural Crime Symposium held earlier this year. Here's Janelle Novel with more on that development. The Crime Symposium, which was spearheaded by the Ministry of National Security, encompassed representatives from various sectors throughout the island. Government officials indicated that a follow-up meeting had been held with a view of finalizing action which was to follow. National Security Minister Honorable Herman Gil Francis explained that several recommendations coming out of the symposium would be acted upon once the council had been implemented. It was decided that the National Security Council should be formed with the Prime Minister as the head. I've written to the leader of the opposition to make sure that he can um, send some representative on that body and so as soon as cabinet has finished and he has given me the go ahead I will be announcing the, the persons who are going to form this National um, Security Council. We also talked about having a national um, security plan and again when the council is set up that will be one of the mandates to give out a, a national security plan. Um, we, we, we talked about a lot of things at, at that time. The, the public reception of um, of the police, how does the, how does the public perceive our police officers at this time? So we want to do a survey and, and be able to, whatever the public comes up with, try and see how we can correct or um, enhance that. Also on the agenda is addressing the absence of proper parenting strategies. According to the National Security Minister, the youth is often blamed for their actions. However, he explained that parents play a role in the proper grooming of children. Honorable Francis highlighted other initiatives to be undertaken by the incoming council. Yes, we seem to blame our youngsters all the time, and we leave out the parents in, in, the, in the whole scenario. And I think that some of the parents have to take some blame in that. And so we want to do a project where we can re-educate our, our, our parents. And there are some parents or people in, in some areas who are looked at as mother or father figures. And we have found out in our investigations that some of these same people are the ones assisting some of these youngsters in hiding their ill-gotten gains. So they're not the parents, but the parents cannot be found, so they um, are a surrogate. And they go to these persons and they actually store some of these um, items for them. Alcohol and marijuana were also subjects of the discussion. The minister indicated that given the use of the substance by the youth, it is imperative that a policy on the usage is implemented. Efforts are also expected to go into revamping the boys' training center to ensure holistic rehabilitation upon exit. From the Government Information Service, I am General Norville. Meantime, the Royal St. Lucia Police Force is helping create more public awareness about cybercrime and staying safe online. Anisia Antoine has more with that story. With the advent of the Government Island Wide Network GINET project, the Royal St. Lucia Police Force, in collaboration with the Ministry of Education and the Department of the Public Service, are working together to conduct training sessions on cybercrime prevention. The target audience are students and teachers who are beneficiaries of the GINET project. On Friday, September 21st, the representatives hosted an assembly for students and teachers of the Canary Secondary School to inform and safeguard them against incidents of cyber crimes. The presentation this morning was, I think, very good, very effective. I learned a lot and I'm sure the students learned a lot. And uh, because many of us acquire the devices, the tablets, the children, their parents give them the tablets and they don't get any guidance as to how to use the internet service. 
So you get, you see, you, you find that many of us put ourselves at risk. The children are at a greater risk. So at least today they learned something that will help guide them. And I learned a lot as well. Cyber crimes are criminal offenses committed via the internet or otherwise aided by various forms of computer technology. The training session addressed cyberbullying, cyberstalking, hacking, identity theft, and social networks. Due to the numerous instances of cyber crime being reported um, at schools and throughout the island, I found it fitting with the implementation of the GINet program, which is a free Wi-Fi internet system being installed in four districts in St. Lucia by um, assistance from the Taiwanese. It was only fitting that we provide them with the necessary training to protect themselves so they can no longer be a victim of cybercrime or cyber issues. According to Sergeant Kami, individuals have already been prosecuted under the recently implemented cybercrime legislation. It is such that an individual, a property or government may end up being a victim. Right? So with this we also taught them how to protect themselves, how to identify issues of cybercrime and how to prevent cyberbullying and child abuse through the cyber world. We ask all the schools, the students that are taught, to go home, tell their family, tell their parents, tell their friends, tell their neighbor about what they have learned with regard to cybercrime and how to protect themselves. Because knowledge is power, and for doing so now, it becomes an easier process for us, the police officers, to deal with issues and instances of cybercrime. The Cybercrime Training Roadshow team is expected to visit the Viewfort Secondary School and the Binfield Secondary School on September 25th and subsequently the Miku Primary and Secondary Schools on September 27th. From the Government Information Service, I am Anisia Antoine reporting. By now, you may have heard that the Ministry of Equity, Social Justice, Youth Development, Sports, Culture and Local Government is conducting the review of clients on the Public Assistance Program for the month of September. The process involves the evaluation of recipients who may have been either terminated or the assistance period extended. The cash transfer service of the Public Assistance Program is reviewed biannually during the months of March and September. Compliance is very important to the Ministry and to this program because if it is that you're deceased, we'll need to know so that you are off the list. However, you need to come in, as I said before, um, and make sure you comply. So there's compliance when it comes to children. The certain levels of compliance that they need to fulfill. So they need to bring in, the parents need to work with the children's updated school records and um, medical records. For the elderly, we need the medical records. And this is to determine whether you're in good health. Because the, the allowances has to be, or the cash transfer really has to be used to make sure that your nutritional needs are met, that you're in good health, and if it is that you're not in good health, what kind of support that we can seek for you, what kind of interventions that we can get, um, get going for that particular individual. In addition to cash transfer, the Welfare Department provides services such as educational assistance, eye care service, burial assistance and disaster or fire assistance. Our numbers are beyond 3,500 and these are individuals with about 3,000 families. Um, this, this is persons who are in receipt of, of public assistance but quite aside from and quite apart from those who are receiving the cash transfer on a monthly basis. There are persons who walk into the department, and it's important for us to say that. There are persons who actually walk into the department, and even if they're not card holders or beneficiaries, but because we offer certain services, we may be able to assist them with other means of getting, getting that, quite aside from cash. So it's not only the cash that, that, that we give, but there are other in-kind support and other forms of support that we may be able to do. Maybe groceries, it may be IK services. At the time of payment, the updated card must be presented by the recipient or someone authorized by him or her. You're watching Nation Beat. Stay with us after this break.
If you're HIV positive or have an STI, having unprotected sex with multiple partners puts them in grave danger. You'll expose every partner and their present and future partners to HIV or another STI. Use a condom every time you have sex. You can live a productive life even if diagnosed with HIV. Remember, early detection is key to your survival. Be responsible, protect yourself and others. Help stop the spread of HIV and other STIs. Welcome back. The Stoke City Community Trust, Premier League, and Sacred Sports Foundation share a common goal to encourage children with disabilities to aim for the stars. The three organizations launched a groundbreaking initiative this week entitled Ability Over Disability that will see a delegation from Stoke City Community Trust work with over 160 youth and train eight youth mentors. My anecdotal experience is, uh, is backed up by a growing global consensus of uh, international institutions like the UN, by government policy, by academic study, and by private sector activity. And of course, most practically through the determined efforts of NGOs and organizations like the Sacred Sports Foundations and Stoke City Football Club Community Trust. I really like the title of the program, Ability Over Disability. In three short words, it makes a powerful positive statement about why the program is so necessary, meaningful and effective. The program's purpose is to facilitate personal growth and development within St. Lucia's special needs community. The program is really designed to build capacity here in St. Lucia. The big issue we have had in working with our special needs community is skills. It isn't desire, it isn't actually financial resources, it's skills, it's human, human relation skills. We need trained coaches, trained mentors, trained people. And through the kind help of Stoke and the Premier League International Development Fund, we have been able to begin to put a, a consistent, cohesive program in place. So um, over the next year or two, we'll be working with three local um, special schools in particular. The group of eight youth mentors will lead a range of sessions throughout the week, including blind football, to engage local youth from the special schools. The United Nations World Tourism Organization has identified September 27 as World Tourism Day under the theme Tourism and the Digital Transformation. In an effort to acknowledge the theme and highlight the contribution which technology has had on the tourism industry, the Department of Tourism Information and Broadcasting will embark on a school's outreach during the period September 24 to 28. Seven schools have been selected to participate. World Tourism Day, celebrated every 27 September around the world, is a unique opportunity to raise awareness on tourism's actual and potential contribution to sustainable development. Efforts at promoting the arts within the Cicero Secondary School have been boosted following the opening of a theater arts room at the institution. More from Funnel Neptune. The theater arts room at the Cicero Secondary School was sponsored by the Edward for Education Foundation and is expected to provide an avenue to enhance the students' performing arts education. The Edward for Education Foundation is endorsed by the Department of Education, Innovation and Gender Relations with the objective of engaging in projects that will provide a better environment for students and teachers. Founder of the foundation, Claudia Ladner, thanked the sponsors of the project and says she remains committed to enhancing the study environment and assisting schools requiring assistance. At this time, I would like to say it was a pleasure working with the Cicero teachers of, on this initiative. We hope you enjoy this room and that magic happens every day. And for me, the fulfillment, I know a lot of people have come up and said a lot of nice things, but for me today, today is the day that I looked forward to. And for me, the, the joy is seeing that it's done and the kids could use it. It was really a blessing seeing them dancing on the stage for the first time. Principal of the Cicero Secondary School, Addie Paul, 
express gratitude to the Edward for Education Foundation for its dedication to transforming the lives of the students, especially those who have a love for the arts. We are now able to use this facility for so many things, to teach our kids something that we are losing, to appreciate art, to be creative, to see beyond what is there, to be aesthetic. So this facility is going to create change, not just for school, but for those students to leave school and develop their creative arts and hopefully change a mindset that will become more appreciative of creative work as a society. District 4 Education Officer Mary George Allen expressed the hope that the Theatre Arts Room will play a significant part in developing creative artists in St. Lucia. Students, I know you will appreciate this space. Not many schools, not many secondary schools are fortunate to have a space like this. I saw this space during the vacation when it was under construction and when I came in here this morning, I was like, wow. So let us just keep that wow effect and so we'll always be grateful to the charity. Besides the Edward for Education Foundation, the project also received financial support from organizations such as Harry Edwards Jewelers, Drying Little Tears Foundation, and JP Services, to name a few. From the Communications Unit of the Ministry of Education, Innovation, Gender Relations, and Sustainable Development, I am Fennel Neptune reporting. The St. Lucia Solid Waste Management Authority continues to struggle with waste management issues across the island. According to officials, illegal dumping, littering, and an unsatisfactory level of compliance as it relates to the management of greenways, bulkways, observance of collection days, derelict vehicles, hamper the day-to-day -day operations of the authority. While population densities and challenges associated with road access may pose challenges for residents, there are no excuses why any resident should dispose of solid waste indiscriminately. An appeal is being made to all residents to please place solid waste out only on the scheduled collection days for your community. That is the, days, the day for regular as well as bulk waste collection. No solid waste should be placed out after the collection vehicle has passed or the, or the day before collection as these practices result in little communities and ideal conditions for the breeding of disease vectors. Illegal dumping continues to be a nightmare for the organization as it remains very difficult to identify the perpetrators of the act. Green waste, construction waste and commercial waste are consistently being dumped on vacant lots and at remote locations. The St. Lucia Solid Waste Management Authority urges those guilty of these acts to desist immediately. Haulers of solid waste are encouraged to instead transport waste to the Dedlow Sanitary Landfill or the Viewfort Solid Waste Management facilities as the sites are open for public use every day except Christmas Day and New Year's Day. To individuals contracting truckers to undertake collection of waste, please be informed that the authority provides information with respect to waste received at the sites. Feel free, therefore, to call the head office of the St. Lucia Solid Waste Management Authority at 453-2208 or the hotline at 450-7070 in order to verify that waste is disposed at the authorized locations by those contracted to do so. And that's how we end Nation Beat this week. Before we say goodbye, this notice. The Department of Infrastructure ports and energy has informed of the temporary closure of the Marisil Road from the Corinth Junction to the Shock Roundabout. The Mon Road from Government House to the Lower Mon Road near the Pave intersection will also be closed. This is to facilitate potholing and cleaning works. The road closures are scheduled for Sunday, September 23, 2018 between the hours of 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. The Department of Infrastructure solicits your cooperation and advises that all road users should exercise caution and due diligence in the immediate vicinity of the work sites. 
the Department of Infrastructure, Ports and Energy apologizes for any inconvenience caused during the road maintenance activity. That's Nation Beat. On behalf of the entire production team here at the Government Information Service, I'm Richmond Felix signing out.